Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Wells Church. If this is your first time here, we hope you feel welcome and that you feel the love we feel for each other and that you come back for more. <laughs> when I signed up to be lay minister a couple of weeks ago, I was thinking about how this was the anniversary of my son's death. Uh, my son John, I think some of you know, I lost his sudden infant death. Yesterday would have been his 40th birthday, uh, is the 40th anniversary of his death. And then I thought, well, that's a kind of a gloomy thing. And then I heard that it was also uh, the anniversary of Jesse's death. And then I heard that it was Keith's anniversary of death. And I thought, well, I guess that's just what I need to talk about anyway. You know, when something like that happens to you, it's a life-changing event. Uh, and I took that opportunity to examine myself and what I thought and believed. And, uh, then I felt kind of guilty for doing all of that. And then I thought, you know, I think the best thing that any of us can really do for ourselves in this life is to try to discover for ourselves exactly who and what we are, actually are, and what we truly believe, and then live that out openly and honestly and with integrity. Some of the many lessons I learned from all of that, this is the uh, uh, condensed version, be prepared for anything because everything can change in an instant. Take nothing for granted. Remember that all of life is a precious gift from the Creator. The only time we have is now. Carpe diem, seize the day. And then my friend John Claypoo said, the same God who provided the good old days must also be trusted to provide the good news, the good new days. And I say amen to that. And the choir will now bring us to worship. Would you please stand and join me in reading the open sentences? Jesus calls us here to meet him as through word and song and prayer. We affirm God's promised presence where his people live and care. Please share the prayer. We give thanks for your presence with us, O oh God. We give thanks for old friends and new friends and friends we have not yet met. May we all do this in the hour of worship, bring you honor and glory. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing all verses of hymn number 340, Come You Saints, Sinners, Poor and Needy.
One verse bears repeating. Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, (laughs) you will never come at all. We come because we are wounded, not because we are well. And part of that woundedness is expressed as we affirm our faith in God and in Christ and in all that he can do in our lives. We turn to 883, if you're not familiar with this particular affirmation, and share together as you choose. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's uh, pause for words of welcome and peace in Christ Jesus. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I'm on. Welcome to you this day. The Lord be with you. We uh, pause now to take a few moments to talk about the life of the church, birthdays and anniversaries, um, celebrations and sadnesses. If you'll take a look at the inside of your bulletin, you'll see all kinds of things that are coming up for us. Uh, continued celebrations of this season of Lent, including our uh, Lenten lunch this Thursday, is with Reverend Dr. C.J. Rhodes. If you've never heard him preach, you know, you're know you going to want to be here on Thursday. That's, uh, that's all I can say uh, for sure. Men's Fellowship Breakfast is next Sunday, 7.15. We will have had an hour, uh, a whole week to adjust to the time change, so we ought to be able to, to be there on time. Take a look at the various events for Holy Week, um, and that includes things like an Easter egg hunt and our final Lenten luncheon. Also, we're adding, uh, Keith has always done, or traditionally done, a healing service on Sunday evening of Easter. Um, Sometimes folks like to spend that afternoon with their family, so we're going to do ours as part of our prayer meeting on Wednesday night of Holy Week, 7 o'clock right here. So join us if you can, and uh, the children and youth will have their regular activities, but join us if if you can and bring a neighbor with you. Um, Other announcements other than what we have printed here, things I'm forgetting about, we need to... uh, Ashley would probably want me to say something about uh, the Easter egg hunt, but uh, uh, just know it's coming up, and we'll remind you about it again as the uh, 31st gets closer. John. I'd just like to say thank you all who helped out, participated with the youth fundraiser slash appreciation banquet on Wednesday night. Um, we had a great time, so thank you for putting on your Mexican hats and coming to eat with us. So thank you. 
<laughs> All right, let's uh, do some birthdays and anniversaries this morning. Who wants to share? Yes. Terry and Brian, happy birthday. Yes, sir. Mr. Shea. <laughs> Shea's birthday is when? Tuesday. Tuesday. Happy birthday. <laughs> okay. My oldest son, Jamie, turns 43 tomorrow, and he and his wife My youngest grandson on Thursday, How wonderful. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Vicki. Sandy, happy birthday. Yes, Mary and or Anthony. All right. How about that? Luella Moore's birthday. Yes. On the 19th. On the 19th. Melanie, Gaden, and Joy. All right. All right. Happy birthday to you. And mine's on Wednesday, by the way, the 14th. <laughs> I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to make a big deal about it. I usually start telling people a month in advance, but anyway, I'm new here, so I didn't do that yet. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So listen, uh, we're paused for joys and concerns now. We're not going to remember all of them or, or get all of them named on our lips. Some named in our hearts. God hears them before we speak them and remembers on our behalf, but we will share a few things. And uh, most urgently, I'd like to share on Uncle Charlie's behalf that uh, the husband of his youngest niece, Angela, uh, uh, Lindy Leeper is his name. Uh, he, he didn't make it into work and she went out and checked on him and he apparently had had a massive heart attack uh, before leaving, and he's, he's a young man. How young is he, Uncle Charlie? 61. So we lift up uh, the, fa the family of Lindy Leeper. Angela is, is most certainly in, in all others. Let's continue to lift up Esther Everly in, in prayer as she continues to work with getting medicines adjusted and so on and so forth. Is there anything new to report there, Jane? We just keep lifting her and John up and Jane um, and Anna as well. Christina Box, successful surgery for um, uh, her daughter uh, in appendicitis, and we're glad that that was successful. And John, we want to continue to lift up your dad. Is he still at St. Dominic? Well, he, he, they could have cracked his chest wide open and they were able to do the aortic valve replacement um, through the, the uh, like stent. yeah, like with the stent. So, y yes. Um, Jerry, we continue to lift up your nephew, Todd, in his uh, fight of cancer. Good. Good. And uh, Ted Murray uh, has had his second uh, cataract surgery, having some more um, uh, struggles there. And certainly lift up Senator Thad Cochran, who made his announcement that I believe April 1st would be his, um, his last, uh, last day on the job. Lifting up all of those living with cancer and uh, lifting up the doctors and the uh, researchers and everyone who has anything to do with bringing care for those with cancer. What things have I forgotten that you'd like to lift up today? Yes, Ken. Oh no. I didn't know that. 
Well, we will continue to lift her up. I wasn't sure how to pronounce her name, so thank yeah. you. Yeah. A praise report then. Thank you. We need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, God's remembered, as we say, we're going to pause for a moment of simple silence that you might lift up privately your own personal prayers of petition and thanksgiving. And uh, Jamie, I'm going to ask if you would just, would you just play us a little interlude during our silent time? Yeah, just, just something to center us and let us go to God in prayer. Thank you, Almighty God, for all your tender mercies to us. Thank you for your grace which abounds. Thank you for creating us to be loved and to love. We gather in your name this morning, weary of the rain, and yet we know that from these flooding waters something good will come. We're counting on it because... That is the measure of your gift and your strength. We gather grateful for prayers answered, and we gather asking patience for those we, we feel are lingering. And yet, oh God, sometimes you give us an answer and we don't recognize it until years later. And so until that time it is revealed, we ask for patience. We know that your son went to a garden, weary and afraid, wondering if a cup might pass from him. But the cup passed through him, O oh God, and in passing through him, it passes through us each and every day of our lives and in very tangible and significant ways each Sunday at Wells. We lift up these we've named on our lips. We lift up what we have named in our heart. We ask your forgiveness for our forgetfulness and are grateful that you work on all things all the time. Your watch never stops. And as we gather here in these quiet moments, O oh God, we ask that you would make of us the believers that you would have us to be. And that as we walk step by step, to Holy Thursday, to the betrayal, to the Good Friday and a Saturday vigil, that we would feel every emotion that when we walk into Easter Sunday, we know beyond the shadow of a doubt, the tomb was empty. And that empty tomb, O oh God, is what brought us here today. For these and all your mercies, we say thank you and ask this in Christ's holy name, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the power.
Would you please stand and join me as we sing the first three verses of Amazing Grace, found on page 378. Please stand. Please remain standing as we share Psalm 107, verses 1 through 9, found on page 830 in the hymnal. <clears throat> oh, give thanks to the Lord, who is good, whose steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in the desert wastes, finding no way to a city in which to dwell. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted with them. Then in their trouble, they cried to the Lord, who delivered them from their distress, and led them by a straight way till they reached a city in which to dwell. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. The Lord satisfies those who are thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. And now, Almighty God, we give thanks for all that you have brought to us, especially for our friend, your Son, and our Savior, Jesus. We return some portions this morning, perhaps more than enough, perhaps not quite enough. But as the plates are passed, O oh God, let us share something, a prayer, a thought, an encouragement. And if we need something, let us take just what we need for the day and pass the plate along. All things come from you, and all of these things belong to you in the first place. Amen. Amen.
That was kind of a weak applause, <laughs> just saying. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Jamie. How about that again, huh? Very nice. Yeah. I think they're, Nancy, I think they're practicing for the Masters. You know, a little golf clap action, you know. You guys joy, uh, bring joy to our hearts, so thank you for sharing. The text for the message this morning for the 830 service comes from John's Gospel, chapter 3. And this is from the message, and if you're able to stand, I would invite you to stand. And John begins, he says, No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. And everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, an eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why. So that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when introduced to him. This is the crisis we're in. God's light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light so the work can be seen for the God work it is. The gospel of our Lord for the people of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'll share with you guys some secrets this morning if you don't really know, but you have to be, you have to be careful because they're pastoral secrets, right? So be careful how you tell these things. The Spirit of Christ is already within you. <gasps> Don't tell anybody. You already have the capacity to forgive. Why? Because you've been forgiven. You already have been healed, so now you have the capacity to heal others as well. And you've been redeemed. I want to say that really deep. Redeemed. You know. And you have the power to redeem others. And most of all, what I get from this particular passage, I'll take engaging and everlasting for eternity, Alex, for a lifetime. You've been loved. Love deeper than you can ever imagine that you've been loved. The love of a human has only scratched the surface. I did a funeral last night. It was supposed to be earlier in the afternoon, but the bride waited until it got dark. Wedding. Well, it was kind of a funeral. <laughs> yeah, I, I was intentional with that. And then as we jaundered through, it became marital bliss because what they thought was going to be a dark time ended up there was a lot of light being shown that they had not planned. And that's kind of what happens here. 
The word says that there's a lot of darkness and people run from it. But what we want to find out is how do we run to the light? Probably the most powerful scripture that any of us have ever memorized, if we memorized any scripture at all, would be John 3.16, right? You've seen it. You've heard it. You've heard the verse used as kind of a Christian shorthand, a thesis statement, if you will, for what it means to be a Christian. Kind of like that Jesus fish bumper sticker or even a simple cross necklace. It's a stand-in for a powerful message about unconditional love, about freedom from fear and even death, about overflowing mercy. But you know what happens? Not everybody knows that, right? And sometimes we find it hard to believe that even in America in the year 2018 that there are people that don't know the saving power of the Son of God through His Father in heaven. Some people act like you got to have a little membership card to get in. And if you don't have that little card, then you're not welcome. And we push people away. Sometimes you find these symbols like the Ichthus, Simple Cross, and others. They're used by people as symbols to kind of ward off people that they don't want around them. If you don't believe me, go back to the Civil Rights Movement. You can find out. So whether or not you choose to use these symbols or not, I encourage you this morning to not let the symbolism stand for itself. We need to be showing love and dispelling fear with our actions toward people. The best way I know how to do that is to symbolize that our God of mercy said, For I so loved you that I gave you. And here I'll call upon the theological tandem of the Avet brothers to share with you that they said, Call the Smithsonian. I've made a discovery. Life ain't forever and lunch, it ain't free. Loved ones will break your heart with or without you. Turns out we don't get to know everything. There's a lot of truth in that. Because we don't know certain things, it causes us to, if we're going to follow the light, to live by faith. Now for some people this is really hard. I've got a good friend who's an atheist. Well, maybe not a full-blown atheist. Maybe kind of an atheist, agnostic, wannabe Christian kind of guy. And in talking with him about this particular scripture this week over a cup of coffee, he said, first of all, the fact that God sent steaks among them for complaining complaining about their food seems a little bit immature on God's part. And I looked at him and I said, and who are we to be calling God immature? You know, (laughs) He says, but why construct this copper snake for everybody to look at? Because that seems kind of like an idol, doesn't it? Well, yeah, you got a pretty good point there. And we all know idols are one of God's biggest pet peeves. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven image. And he asked me this question. He said... Why couldn't they just have wholeheartedly asked for forgiveness, made a sacrifice, performed some ritual, had Moses lay their hands upon him? And me being a seminary graduate, I said, well, I'm glad you asked me that question. Kind of, yes, yes, almost. What happens here in this particular passage that's being referred to in John's gospel is a foreshadowing of of who Christ would be. The fact that Christ symbolized the serpent who became sin for our sake. That upon him is the solution to the snake bite, the result of original sin. And through him we might find healing and restoration. I always wondered when I'd go in the doctor's office what those little snakes wrapped around that little pole were about, you know. 
It always scared me even more than the needle. But the symbol symbolizes an energy, a serpentine energy, at the base of our spines, which wraps up and around the spine and awakens our chakras. The masculine and the feminine energies interweave around our spine to meet us at the throne of our minds, the pineal gland, which is referred to as the third eye, the mind's eye. So you think about that. Jesus is saying that we have an awakening that can happen to us, an enlightened mind. We become aware of how to live with our bodies as the temple and to treat them with respect and dignity. You have those presence of the things in you, forgiving, healing, redeeming, loving. When I began one of my seminary degrees, we had a professor and he said this to us. He said, if you fail, you will fail because you went into hiding. We're like, what do you mean? Is that an option? You mean you don't have to come to class? No, that's not what I'm saying is if you just get so caught up and you don't participate and you don't come to class and you don't do your work and you get so overwhelmed that you go into hiding, that's when you fail. I think sometimes we all get caught up in our isolation issues that we feel better when we're by ourselves. But there's something about being drawn to a community of faith that encourages us when, when we want to be by ourselves. It's nice to have somebody during the passing of the peace of Christ saying, you know what, I'm praying for you. And no, they're not just saying it. I was blown away this week by the people that prayed for my dad. And the countless phone calls, texts, and messages, not even on the book of face. Prayer works when people work together. It can happen. See, the message of the gospel is that we can't save ourselves. And for me, that's good news. We have secret struggles that are toxic. Things that we look to during this time of the year, during Lent, as we journey towards Holy Week. We think about guilt and shame and the things that we've got bottled up all inside of us. Things that if we don't take care of can literally kill us. And so I hear these words in John's gospel of coming to the light that can save us. If we admit that we screwed up and we ask for help and we show someone of our, our dark secrets and let them out, it's amazing how healing can happen, followed by redemption and all wrapped up in a nice bow with the gift of love. And when you when you Move toward the light from your isolation. You find out that you're not the only one. That there are other people that have dealt the same thing that you have. There are other people that need to be healed just as you need to be healed. There are other people that need to feel love deep down inside of them. <coughs> Brother Roger was the founder of the Christian monastic community, community called Tzi. It's in France, and he had an intriguing definition for the season of Lent. This is what he says. Forty days granted us in which to marvel at a love too great for words. Anybody in here remember the first time somebody said, I love you to you? What that meant? Maybe it was a spouse-to-be. Maybe it was a girlfriend, boyfriend. I don't know. Maybe it was just a friend who said, you know what? I love you. I have love for you like a brother or like a sister. The various kinds of love. But for someone to say, I love you, and to really mean it. Brother Roger doesn't talk about giving up something or taking on something. He didn't say anything about a season of repentance or self-examination. He asked, in essence, what better way is there to draw closer to God and to God's purposes 
than simply to take a step back and be astonished by the fact that God loves you. Somebody asked me one time if I really cared anything about the theory of relativity. Thank you. That's what I did. I just kind of laughed. I don't know that I can know that. I mean, I know what, you know what it means, all the symbols and all that. But what I do know more than even that is that I am loved. I'm loved by a woman by the name of Leanne. I'm loved by parents, Bob and Estelle. I'm loved by a mentally handicapped brother that's 60 years old that's only about two and a half in his mind. And I know that he loves me because he calls me his partner. I know that he loves my daughter, Courtney, because he says, this is my sweet little Courtney. There's something about unconditional love that slays me. You may not know the theory of relativity, but you can daggum well better bet that you know that you are loved beyond a shadow of a doubt. You see, Jesus was and remained a faithful Jew his whole life. He was steeped in all the traditions of the prophets and the law, and the two could not be separated from his mind. This life was a source of blessing for all people. You see, the prophets, though, were concerned with the way in which their nation lived out the call as God's chosen people. God chose them, catch this now, not for privilege, but for mission. It's the same way God chooses us, not for privilege. I mean, yeah, we can say we're a child of God, but it's also about the mission. And when I know deep in my soul that I am loved despite all the junk that's in me, I'm free to love myself. But also, you know what's even better than that? Is I'm free to love other people. Because I'm not hung up on my junk, I can't get hung up on their junk. A verse that I read, or a couple verses I read in every wedding that I do, comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. And it talks about various characteristics of what it means to, to have love. And verse 14 says, but make sure you put on love. Because love is what binds the rest of these things together in perfect harmony. The love that Christ came down from heaven to bring each other and to us binds everything in perfect harmony. And some, you know, some people look at this particular scripture and they have different interpretations. But one of the things I've learned about biblical interpretation is that you, if you pay attention to a context, then you're going to be better off than you just pick out a single verse. You know, it's kind of like that guy that said, I'm going to open my Bible today and, and I'm going to point into the scriptures and whatever that says, that's what I'm going to do. He opened up the Bible, he put his thumb down in there and said, and Judas hanged himself. <laughs> Not a really good method of reading scripture, right? This verse, these verses that we read this morning are part of a larger passage where Jesus meets the need of this synagogue leader in the middle of the night. And in the early church, a church that was under persecution, there were a lot of secret meetings. To be Christian was very dangerous, something that we know nothing about. And if you don't think that still exists in the world, I invite you just to flip over and just go study the Middle East for the last year and a half. And you'll find out that Christians are losing their lives every day because of their faith. In America, it doesn't cost you a dime. And in some ways, that's sad. But the Christian movement grew and persisted. And because I believe, I think it gave purpose for those lives. And that's what began to evolve and to change the world. In John's gospel, Jesus is about justice, compassion, love, and equality. The Christian life is about living a life of grace. And in the midst of that grace... 
doing whatever we can promote the God's vision of grace. I think if we've truly tried to live that way, if we try to avoid sin, to which some people be, seem to be very concerned about pointing out our sins, you know, I think life will take care of itself if you're aware of it. I've never been to Rome. I'd love to go. I'd love to go sit at a table and read Dear Abby. But we'll see if that ever happens. But I have a friend who went to Rome about a year ago. He said one of the coolest things was visiting St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican. He said they told him to climb to the roof, so he and a few folks climbed to the roof. And they said, when you get up there, walk backwards towards the square. And so as they walked backwards towards the square, he said he found himself amongst all these lifelike statues of these unbelievable saints and also this huge lifelike statue of Jesus Christ. My friend said when he saw that one, he just stopped and looked out over the city and for a moment he sort of grasped what redemption was all about. As we read that psalm this morning together, I think redemption is gathering up from various countries, from north, south, east, and west. God gathers us all up, draws us together in this circle of love, of forgiveness, of belonging, and home. Our destiny is to be gathered up. It is God's final and ultimate plan for us and for all creation. There's a wideness in God's mercy. I cannot find on my own. And he keeps this fire burning to melt this heart of stone. It keeps me aching, keeps me yearning, keeps me glad to have been caught in the reckless, raging fury that's called the love of God. I've seen no band of angels and I've heard no soldier songs. Love hangs over me like a banner. Love within me leads me on to the battle on the journey and it's never going to stop ever widening their mercies and the fury of his love. Amen.